So uh, I call this talk History of Astronomy Part One uh, because the last time I gave this was about five years ago and it was trying to encompass too much. So I've broken it into a couple of different parts. So this section will cover astronomy up to the use of photographic equipment, which will again change our understanding of the universe. This talk is not intended to be an in-depth discussion of any one person or topic. It is more of an overview of the road travel to got us to the point we are today. It's not an exhaustive list of all the people in the journey, but I felt that these people contributed something important and hopefully you'll feel that way too. Okay. So before telescopes, we only had our eyes and a few instruments to see what's out in the night sky. So where to begin? To understand astronomy, you need to start somewhere, so I picked ancient Greece. It's where mankind began to formally develop the math and sciences we've come to know. The Greeks developed elegant theories, mathematical formulae, and described wonders of cosmos, a word, by the way, also coined by the Greeks. So who are these early Greeks? Well, we start off with Theus of Pilatus, and if I, we have experts here that will pronounce it better than I did. I was going to have Google say all these names for me, but I never got around to that. So what was his, uh, he was a philosopher, he was renowned, uh, one of, known as one of the seven wise men. Uh, he had come to, uh, he has many, known for his many sayings, some of which are know thyself and nothing in excess. He's remembered for his concept of cosmology based on water. He viewed it as the essence of all matter. He saw the earth as a flat disk floating on a vast sea. He's also credited with formulating five geometric theorems, which may be familiar to you. I'll let you read that for a second. Next, we come to the universe. Uh, he was the first to conceive of a mechanical model of the world, and, oops, and he was the first to consider the sun a huge gas, massive gas. Then we have Pythagoras, which I can say. Uh, he taught that he was famous for teaching the metapsychosis or the transmigration of souls. He believed that the souls were immortal and upon death entered into a new body. He was also credited with credit, creating many math, mathematical and scientific discoveries. He was the first to divide the globe into the five climatic regions. He was the first to teach that the earth was spherical. And by the end of the fifth century BCE, this fact was generally accepted among the Greeks. He was also the first to identify the morning star and the evening star as the same celestial object, which we now know as Venus. Now come to Plato. It's well known that in the ancient world, planets sometimes moved erratically. At times they seemed to change speed, to speed up, slow down in their revolutions. And sometimes they would even appear to move backwards. claimed that these apparently irrational movements could be explained by supposing that each planet moved not on one, but several circular tracks. Planetary motion should be thought of as a combination of orbits within orbits in which the clockwise turn on one track would cause the adjacent track to move counterclockwise and so on. This view he felt might result in the creation of a regular geometric model, what would look like highly irregular behavior. A better example could be that one of discovering order behind disorder. So as he said, the saving of the phenomenon, the impact of this notion stuck around for quite a long time. He was a Greek philosopher, astronomer, and mathematician. He also wrote on geography and contributed the philosophical discussions in Plato's Academy. Although none of his writings survived, his contributions are known for many discussions 
throughout antiquity. He established the first sophisticated geometric model of the celestial motions, the Exodus's planetary theory of spheres. He considered the, which he considered the perfect form. People have questioned whether the spheres were just a computational device since there is no reference as to what the spheres were made of, contributed to the identification of constellations, uh, identified, thus the development created the, sorry, created the observational world, calculated the length of the year to be 365 days and six hours, considered to have constructed the first star chart. Around 370 BCE, Odysseus developed a theory of proportion that resolved problems associated with irrational numbers. From this theory, he formulated a method of exhaustion, a way of determining the areas of a curved figures and volume of cones. This foreshadowed integral calculus. He also named a number of stars and compared their brightnesses, which I would assume is we call magnitudes now. Aristotle, I can pronounce that one. Along with the teacher Plato, he has been called the father of Western philosophy. His writings cover many subjects, including physics, biology, zoology, metaphysics, logic, ethics, aesthetics, poetry, theater, music, rhetoric, psychology, linguist, linguistics, economics, politics, and government. Aristotle also believed Earth was the center of the universe. He believed all matter was composed of basic elements of earth, water, air, and fire, and the heavens were composed of a transparent fifth element called ether. He explained that the movements of the planets and the stars were in different spheres, and the spheres were invisible because they were made up of ether and moved around the earth like gears in a watch. Now, Deuces, May, and as said before, uh, his system was simply an abstract geometrical model, but Aristotle took it to be a description of the physical world and, and complicated it by the addition of even more spheres <laughs> still. And here is what the, their model uh, looked like. Is this running? Now, what was interesting about this is uh, he also took into account with this model the migration of the planets above and below the horizon. So it wasn't that they just traveled in a flat plane. That's what that little symbol right there is doing. So uh, let's see. By suitable combination of spheres, the periodic motion of planets could be represented approximately, but the system is also as geometry of an intrinsic merit because of the hippopodae hip or horse fetter, an eight-shaped curve, which Edusis represented a planet's apparent motion in latitude as well as retrograde. Aristotle's authority as a scientist was so imposing that this view of the universe was accepted as truth for nearly, for many hundreds of years, well into the Middle Ages. And that's Aristotle's depiction of the, the solar system or the universe. Now we have Ptolemy. He's known to have made astronomical observations in Alexandria and Egypt between 127 and 141 common era. He probably lived into the reign of Marcus Aurelius from 16, uh, 161 to 180. Beyond the fact that on his, on the faculty of judgment, that's a, a book attributed to him, indicates his adherence to Stoic doctrine Nothing more of his biography is available. Uh, Ptolemy's Algamist is a thirteen is thirteen books in which he establishes 
the kinetic models, purely mathematical, not physical, used to explain solar, lunar, and planetary motions, and is one of the most influential scientific works for more than a thousand years, and is still the main source of our knowledge of ancient astronomy. Oh, I should be doing this at the time. Aristotle's model of the universe had trouble explaining some planetary phenomena. The most striking of these were retrograde motion. The planets seemed to grow brighter or dimmer as they moved through the sky. Townley argued that the planets move on two sets of circles, a deferent and an epicycle. Where this did not fit, Townley proposed an eccentric. Townley's last device was in a quant. In a quant, a planet would speed up and slowed down, but when seen from an off-center point, actually appeared to be moving in a uniform speed. From Earth, however, the planet's motion would look quite irregular. And that's a representation, I don't know if I'm going to spend a little time examining. Can you see my mouse? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, the planet would be orb making these little tiny orbits over here as it's traveling around the Earth, but the center of the orbit was not really here. It was kind of more where this point was. So from the Earth, at this point, the planet would look like it was closer, and then at that point, it would look like it was farther away. But as you can see, they were very, they very much insisted that everything had to be a perfect circle. So he just kept making circles within circles. And it kind of all worked. It didn't look too closely. He was also famous for naming 29 of the 48 constellations, many of which, I think all of which we still are using today. I don't know, Dave, is that correct? Okay. So he did a few things. So we're gonna jump a, a few hundred years to the late Middle Ages. Oops, I'm gonna bring my mouse back over. Uh, so a period which uh, European history lasting from about 1300 to 1500 CE. So what did he, what did uh, Jean Burden do? Well, he's a French philosopher who wrote extensively on the logic and, and natural philosophy, although he is one of the most famous influential logicians, philosophers, and theologians of the later Middle, middle Ages. He is today probably not well that not well known. Many of his works are still available only in Latin. Uh, Burden sowed the seeds of the Copernican Revolution in Europe. He developed the concept of impetus, the first step towards a modern concept of inertia, and the important development in history of medieval science. Among Burden's achievements in his mechanics, a revision of Aristotle. Sorry, Aristotle's theory of motion, which had maintained that things kept moving by the air surrounding it, Buridan developed the theory of impetus by which the mover imparts the moved object the power proportional to the speed, and it keeps moving. In addition, he correctly theorized that resistance of the air progressively reduces the impetus and that the weight can add or detract from speed. His most Familiar uh, thought experiment was known as Burden's Donkey. Although the illustration is named after Burden's philosophers have discussed the concept before him, notably Aristotle, who put forward an example of a man equally hungry and thirsty. The dilemma of a particular kind of moral choice between two evidently identical items is illustrated by a celebrated allegory, Burden's Ass. Although the animal mentioned in Burden's commentary was uh, actually a dog. His discussion centers on the method by which a dog chooses between two equal amounts of food placed before him. Discerning both a symmetry of information and a symmetry of preference, the two items he concludes that the dog must choose at random. This out outcome leads to the investigation of the theories of probability. I thought that was 
And you wonder where all these, you know, where it started. So that started back in the 1300s. So Nicholas Orismi, a significant philosopher of the later Middle Ages. Uh, he was one of the most original thinkers of the 14th century, developing concepts and ideas which anticipated scientific breakthroughs of scientists centuries later. He was an economist, a mathematician, a physicist, astronomer, philosopher, psychologist, and a musicologist. He was also a passionate theologian, and he was a bishop of Le Sunt. Uh, I guess that's French. He served as a counselor for King Charles of France, and at his beat has translated several works of Aristotle into French and wrote numerous works popularizing science. In his book, Louvre de Sile et du Monde, Horst May discussed a range of evidence for and against the daily rotation of the Earth on its axis. I'll just put all these up first. From astronomical considerations, he maintained that the, if the Earth were moving and not the celestial spheres, all the mo movements that we see in the heavens that are computed by the astronomers would appear exactly the same as if the spheres were rotating around the earth. He rejected the physical argument that if the earth were moving, the air would be left behind causing a great wind. In his view, earth, water, and air would all share the same motion. As to the scriptures passage that speak of the motion of the sun, he includes that this passage conforms to the customary usage of popular speech and not to be taken literally. He also noted that it would be more economical for a small earth to rotate on its axis than the immense sphere of the stars. All his references were based on his religious belief. Nonetheless, he concluded that none of these arguments were conclusive and everyone maintains, and I think for myself, he says, that the heavens do move and not the earth. So what I got out of that was, if uh, God can make the universe move around the earth, he can also make the earth move. And since he didn't, he wasn't going to make that decision. He just stayed with the conformity at the time. Nicholas de Cusa. Let's put all those out. Uh, papal legate in Germany from 1446. He was appointed cardinal for his merits by Pope Nicholas V in 1448. In 1459, he became vicar general in the Papal States. Spoken about as a model of a Renaissance man because of his disciplined and very learning, Cusa was skilled in theology, mathematics, philosophy, science, and the arts. He described uh, the learned man as one who is aware of his own ignorance. Just as the universe has no circumference, said Nicholas, so it has no fixed center. The earth is not the center of the universe, nor it is absolutely at rest. Like everything else, it moves in space with a motion that is not absolute, but is relative to the observer. Now, this is in the 1400s. Predating Copernicus by half a century, Nicholas suggested that the earth was nearly spherical in shape, and revolved around the sun and that each star itself a distant sun. He was not, however, describing a scientifically verifiable theory of the universe. His beliefs, which proved uncannily accurate, were based almost entirely on his own personal speculations and numerolo numerological calculations. In the field of mathematics, he developed the concept of infinitesimal and of relative motion. He was the first to use concave lenses to correct myopia, and he conducted the first modern formal biology, biology experiment, concluding that plants absorb nutrition from the air, proving that the air has weight. Other notable achievements included the improvement in the counting of the pulse proposed by to compare the rate of pulses by weighing a quantity of water running out of a water clock while the pulse beat 100 times. We now use watches with second hands. It's a little more convenient than carrying around a big pail of water, but the merit of introducing this kind of useful observation into clinical me 
medicine belongs to him. Uh, in fact, in 2001, there were uh, six centuries from his birth was celebrated on four continents. Nicholas Copernicus, probably, yeah, most a name you probably know the most. Just, so I don't have to worry about these. So he was a Renaissance uh, era polymath who formulated a model of the universe that placed the sun rather than the earth at the center of the universe. His publication of Copernicus's model in his book on the revolutions of the celestial sphere before his death in 1543. So Copernicus uh, summarized his heliocentric theory. It listed assumptions upon which the theory was based as follows. There is no one center of all the celestial spheres. But the center of the Earth is not the center of the universe, but only the center towards which heavenly bodies move and the center of the lunar sphere. So he already knew then that the moon orbited differently than the rest of the, the rest of the heavens. He briefly recalled that in antiquity, uh, Pythagorean had asserted that the um, had asserted the motion of the Earth. All spheres surround the Sun, as if they were in the middle of them all, and therefore the center of the universe is near the Sun. The ratio of Earth's distance from the Sun to the height of the firmament, the outermost celestial sphere containing the stars, is so much smaller than the ratio of Earth's distance from the Sun. But the distance from the Earth is imperceptible in comparison with the height of the firmament. So he said the stars are really far away. It's... So whatever motion appears in the firmament arises not from any motion of the firmament, but of the Earth's motion. The Earth, together with its circumgen Elements perform complete rotations on fixed poles, while the firmament and the highest heaven abide on the sun. What appears to us as motions of the sun not arise not from its motion, but from the motion of the earth. He likes he was very verbose in his books, is which we resolve about the sun like any other planet. The earth then has more than one motion. The apparent retrograde and direct motion of the planets arises not from their motions, but from our view from the Earth. He realized that his he realized that his model of the universe meant that the universe was, as he put it, similar to the infinite, because he could see no parallax of the stars from Earth in its orbit. That would take another two hundred years. He could not extricate himself from perennial cosmological dilemma. Because even at those times, these people were also very religious. So he's thinking one thing and be having been taught something else, which caused him great anxiety. He would have to surrender the sun's centrality. So it was bad enough he was giving up the earth as the center of the universe. He's now thinking to himself, well, the sun isn't really the center of the universe either, since the course of the infinite can have no center. So. I think that, so he just basically said, I'm not going to think about it anymore. <laughs> so even with him, he he's still, you see on this chart here, he's, he is still stuck on the fact that even though the sun is in the middle, and this is, you know, the chart he did for public consumption, here's what he did for his, so he still has his little epicycles because he hasn't given up on the fact that orbits are circular. So even his calculations are still holding on to a bit of the past. I thought that was interesting. Johann Kepler. Okay, we've uh, we've jumped uh, another few years. Uh, uh, Kepler, let me just... Uh, Kepler became the first enthusiastic Copernican after Copernicus himself, he found an astronomy whose clumsy geocentric or heliocentric planetary mechanism typically erred by several degrees. And if left with a unified and physically motivated heliocentric system nearly, he left it with a 
motivated heliocentric system nearly 100 times more accurate. Scholarly effort did not come easily or quickly. He still tried to fit in epicycles. Still can't really ready to give that up, even even though he was saying that there was uh, it was a, a, the orbits were oval, but there was a little problem of the fact that the speed changed whether when it was at the farther orbit than it was a than when it was closer to the sun. So in order to make up the difference of the lag time, he was throwing in epicycles to say, well, it took longer because it was out there for some reason, it was doing more gyrations than it was doing when it was doing closer to the sun. So we haven't really gotten, he, didn't, he was there, but to think, oh, he solved the problem, he was still stuck in the past too. Uh, Kepler's law of planetary motions or the three scientific laws describing motions of the planets uh, was published between 1609 and 1619, improved heliocentric theory of Copernicus, replaced circular orbits with epicycles with their elliptical trajectories. Planetary orbits explain why velocities vary. Kepler's law of planetary motions were not immediately accepted. Uh, major figures like Galileo and Descartes completely ignored them. Uh, many astronomers objected to Kepler's introduction of physics into the astronomy because that is really the cosmology, cosmetology. Uh, he adopted a compromise. Uh, so uh, or accepted the ellipt some people accepted the compromise where they had elliptical orbit, but replaced Kepler's area law with the formula of motion. Now, this took a long time. He was developing this over the course of decades. It wasn't one day he woke up. He was still trying, eventually gave up the ellipses as he refined his, his uh, formulas. So it wasn't, it was more of a trial and error kind of thing. It wasn't one day he woke up, oh yeah, here's this, here's the law of motion. Here's, a, like I said, it took 10 years over the period of at least 10 years uh, before he published any of those. Uh, he culminated in uh, Isaac Newton's principle of Mathematica in 1687, in which uh, Newton derived Kepler's laws from planetary motion from a force-based theory of universal gravitation. He was also involved in optical research. He was interested arose from a direct result of his observations of a partial solar eclipse of 10 July 1600, following the inst instructions from Tycho Brahe he constructed a pinhole camera with his measurements made in the grass marketplace, closely duplicated Brahe's and seemed to show the moon's apparent diameter was considerably less than the sun's. He soon realized that phenomenon resulted from the finite aperture of the instrument. His analysis assisted actual threads led to clearly defined concept of light ray and the foundation of modern geometrical optics. So they weren't. So here's, again, for those that don't know it, uh, here's his three laws. Uh, any questions that I might be able to answer from anybody? Or anybody want to ask a question that somebody else can answer? Okay, we'll keep going. Galileo, let's spend a little time with Galileo. Okay, now we're uh, we're coming across a barrier right now because up to this point, all the observations that were made were made with the naked eye, as they say. The earliest known lenses actually were from uh, on Earth in Nimrud, in 750 BCE, most powerful ancient lenses yet discovered were found in Crete back in the fifth century. Bring these up. Uh, he had the ability to magnify clearly up to seven times as much as 20 times, albeit with considerable distortion. Now, Galileo. So it wasn't the first time that, mag that uh, not the telescopes per se, but magnification using glass to magnify objects was known at the time. And like I said, even 
quite a few hundred years ago, thousand years ago. Uh, he was an Italian astronomer, physicist, engineer, sometimes described as a polymath. He had been the father of observational astronomy, father of modern physics, father of scientific method, father of scientific of modern science. Based only on uncertain uh, descriptions from the first practical telescope from Hans Lippershey, he tried the patent in uh, 1608. Gallo made the following year a telescope with about 3x magnification. He later improved it to versions that would magnify up to 30 times, which was getting to a point which you can actually use them to look at distant objects. With Galilean telescope, an observer could see magnified upright images on the Earth. It's commonly known as a terrestrial scope or spyglass. You could also use it to observe the sky. And for a time, he was one of those that could construct telescopes good enough for that purpose. On August 25th, 1609, he demonstrated one of his early telescopes with a magnification of about eight or nine to Venetian lawmakers. The telescopes were also a profitable sideline for him. And he sold them to merchants who found them useful at sea and as items for trade. In early 1611, Galileo journeyed to Rome to exhibit his telescope and discoveries uh, to the Jesuits of the Roman college, who had first been dubious, but confirmed them and honored Galileo. What did he observe? So from September 1610, Galileo observed Venus. It had a full set of phases similar to the moon. Uh, he observed that Saturn, uh, Saturn's rings, but he first mistook the rings for other planets, thinking it was a three-bodied system. And then when he looked later, Saturn's rings were turned on edge to the Earth, causing him to think that two of the bodies had disappeared. And when they reappeared back in 1616, he got confused even more. So he also observed that the planet he also was the first to observe the planet Neptune in 1612. It appears in his notes as one of many unremarkable dim stars. He did not realize that it was a planet, but he did note its motion relative to the stars before losing track of it. So he did notice that it was moving different than the rest of the stars. It just then put two and two together, who was at the time, who was thinking of another planet all, all that is known has already been known, so there's no reason to think there's another planet out there. So, and we still today, the first four uh, moons on Jupiter, the Galilean moons, and that he found in uh, January 7th, 1610, he observed with his telescope, uh, described as three fixed stars totally invisible by their smallness, meaning you could only see it in the telescope. They were all close to Jupiter and lying in a straight line. His observations on subsequent nights showed the position of these quote-unquote stars relative to Jupiter were changing in a way that would have been inexplicable if they had really been fixed stars. On John the 10th, he noted that one of the stars had disappeared, and he assumed that it was attributed to it being hidden by the planet Jupiter. A few days later, he concluded that the, they were moons orbiting Jupiter, and he discovered three of the Jupiter's fourth largest moon. And then on the 13th, he discovered the fourth. What else did he look at? He looked at the sun. With the sun, he says, they raised the existence of another difficulty with the unchanging perfection of the heavens as posited in orthodox religion. Galileo became blind because of a combination of cataracts and glaucoma. It was also believed he may have gone blind from staring at the sun. Uh, in Galileo's letters on sunspots, which was published in Rome in 1613 under the auspices of the Lycian Academy, uh, he spoke out decisively for the Copernican system for the first time in print in the same book, he found a place for his first published mention of the concept of conservation of angular momentum and an associated inertial concept. During its composition, he had taken pains to determine 
that the theological status of the idea of incorruptibility of the heavens was finding that this was regarded by churchmen as aristocrian instead of Catholic dogma. But attacks against Galileo and his followers soon appeared. Uh, they came to a head with the denunciation from the pulpit in Florence in late 1614. But we will, we all know, know what happened to that. So but that was, I digress. Let's go back to what he observed. On November 30th in 1609, he aimed his telescope at the moon. Galileo was the first to deduce the causing of the uneven waning as light occlusion from lunar mountains and craters. In his study, he also made topographical charts estimating the heights of the mountains. He then looked at the Milky Way. The stars Galileo observed in the Milky Way, previously believed to be nebulous, were found to be a multitude of stars packed so densely that they appeared from Earth to be clouds. He located many other stars too distant to be visible with the naked eye. He has also observed the double star Miser in Ursa Major in 1617. So here I have a little chart uh, and with his telescope, he was able to show that we lived in a sun-centered sun -centered system and not an earth-centered. So if we take a look at this chart, if you notice, if we're earth-centered and then we're looking at Venus, only a small portion of the visible part of Venus would be viewed from the earth. And as he said, he could see all the phases of Venus light on the moon. And as you can see in this illustration. So again, more evidence that the Earth was not the center of everything. It was a counselor and mayor of Danzig in the kingdom of Poland. As an astronomer, he gained a reputation as the founder of lunar topography and described 10 new constellations, seven of which are still used by astronomers. In 1641, he built an observatory on the roofs of his three connected houses, equipped it with splendid instruments, ultimately including a large Keplerian telescope of 150 feet focal length with a wood and wire tube he constructed himself. This may have been the longest tubed telescope before the advent of tubeless aerial telescopes. He compiled an atlas of the moon published in 1647, containing one of the earliest detailed maps of its surface, as well as for many of its features. A few of his names for lunar mountains are still in use and a lunar crater is named for it. He made also a catalog of 1,500 plus stars, uh, the most comprehensive of its time, a uh, celestial at atlas, which several constellations now are accepted. Was shown for the first time after his death, the catalog and the atlas were published together in 1690 by his wife, who had collaborated with him in his observations. In May, 1679, a young Englishman named Edmund Haley visited him as emissary of the Royal Society, who Hevelius had been a member of since 1664. Haley had been instructed by the Royal Society to per persuade him to use his telescope to verify Haley's measurements. Yet Hevelius demonstrated that he didn't really care for telescopes. He could do very well with the naked eye and a quadrant, and an alidade. He is thus considered the last astronomer to whom major work without the use of a telescope can be attributed to. In his star atlas, he actually tucked in a little cartoon in the corner of one of his charts with a cherub holding a card with the Latin motto, the naked eye is best. Isaac Newton. Okay, so Sir Isaac Newton, English mathematician, physicist, astronomer, theologian, and author described in his own day as a natural philosopher, 
who is widely recognized as one of the most influential scientists of all time, is a key figure in the scientific revolution. While undergrad at Trinity College, Cambridge, the scientific revolution was well underway. Astronomers, including Nicholas Copernicus, Johann Kepler, and had elaborated the heliocentric system, and Galileo had set a foundation for the mathematical science of motion. However, European universities, including Cambridge, still stressed outmoded academic models that Aristotle had reported, and the rest um, rested on the geocentric view of the universe. So in 1679, Newton returned to his work on celestial mechanics, considering gravitation and its effect on the orbits of planets, referencing Kepler's laws of planetary motion. Newton worked out the proof that elliptical form of planetary orbits result from the centripetal force inversely proportional to the square of the radius vector. Uh, he published his works on July 5th, 17, uh, 16, 17, 1687, uh, in his work, he said that the three universal laws of motion, together these laws describe the relationship between an object and the forces acting upon it and the resulting motion laying the foundation for classical mechanics. In, the late, six, in late 1668, he built his first reflecting telescope. He chose a spherical shape for his mirror instead of a parabola to simplify construction and added to his reflector what is the hallmark of the design of a Newtonian telescope, a secondary diagonal mounted mirror near the primary mirror's focus to reflect the image at 90 degrees. We all know what that looks like. He found that the telescope worked without color distortion and that he could see the four Galilean moons of Jupiter and crescent phase of Venus with it. Edmund Haley, in 1684, again, he made his first visit, uh, to, to Isaac Newton in Cambridge and led his prominent role in the development of gravitational theory in 1716, devised a method for the observing the transit of Venus across the disk of the sun, predicted for the 1761 and 69 in order to determine accurately by solar parallax, the distance of the earth from the sun, in 1718, compared recently observed star positions with data recorded in the ancient Greeks, Ptolemy Algamus, he found that Sirius and Arcturus had slightly shifted their positions with respect to their neighbors. This was the discovery of what modern astronomers call proper motion from an observatory constructed on St. Helena, recorded a transit of Mercury across the sun realized a similar transit of Venus could determine the size of the solar system. He used his observations to expand contemporary star maps, aided in observationally proving Isaac Newton's laws of motion, funded the publication of Newton's influential uh, book, Philosophy Naturalis Principa Mathematica, from his, uh, in September of 1682. Observations used the laws of motion to compute the period of Halley's Comet, named after him in uh, predicted return in 1758. Frederick Herschel, another significant name in the history of astronomy, uh, pioneered astronomical spectrography, used prisms and temperature measuring equipment to determine the wavelength distribution of stellar spectra in 1779, had undertaken the first review of the heavens in which he examined stars down to the fourth magnitude. In March 1781, during his search for double stars, he discovered Uranus was not one of the planets known since the dawn of history, and Herschel first supposed it to be a comet. Uh, he wanted to call it Georgium Sidus to honor King George III, but it became more conventionally known as Uranus. Taking lessons from local mirror builder, he obtained both the tools and level expertise, started his own reflecting telescope business. He received a 4,000 4, pound money uh, from King George for to cover the cost of building his 40 foot telescope. On the 1st of March, 1774 began 
an astronomical journal by noting the observations of Saturn's rings and the Great Orion Nebula. Early work focused on double stars, examining changes in the apparent separation to allow proper motion of the star and by means of parallax shifts, Herschel's second review of the sky, which extended to stars of the eighth magnitude and resulted in a first catalog in 1782 of 269 double and multiple stars. Let me end my talk at the beginning of another field. Early photography, even as recently as the age of the film camera, was a marriage between optics and chemistry. It relied on the understanding of how to capture light and keep it using chemicals that react to light in specific and predictable ways. Homage Wedgwood was the first person that thought to use this technique of image capture of chemicals. While his early experiments were largely successful, there were still problems with the process. Mainly one that once you expose it to light, it would ruin the image. So it was nice as long as it never saw the light of day. Knowledge of his experiments made its way from England to France, where it inspired the next round of attempts to discover a better method. Joseph Nikifor Nipsey would become the first Frenchman to fix his name in history in the books when he came up with a method not only to capture images, but keep them permanent. His method was known as heliograph photography. It involved the use of pewter plate coated in butamin combined with the light from the sun an exposure time of several days. Just like that, in 1882, the world had its first photograph. That's a view out of his window. And you can sort of see buildings. I guess they weren't moving too much. Uh, the view from his window is the earliest surviving photograph we have. It represents a major leap. Uh, and again, this is the first reported photograph captured. This was 1822. So it's gonna be another 20 years before the first known image of a celestial object was photographed, can you guess? So on March 23rd, 1840, New Yorker named William, John William Draper became the first person to take a picture of the moon. Now that's 20, years after the first picture was taken. So it took that long. Uh, he studied the photochemistry to come up with better ways to take pictures. Finally, we had two things we needed to get astrophotography off the ground and into the sky. And today we capture images without a thought. I took that at CapTree in 2019. A whole bunch of us went there to observe uh, the transit of Mercury. And thank you, that is all.